The real truth about sin is our subject for this evening, as it was this afternoon when I called it, What is Sin? I'll tell you briefly what we talked about at our 12 o'clock service. I stressed that sin is fundamentally a conscious choice to go contrary to God's will. Tonight, I will introduce some concepts that I did not mention earlier today. One, I will deal with the question, can I be guilty of Adam's sin? Two, is my sinful nature itself a sin? Three, is a baby born guilty of sin? Four, what is this thing called a sense of unworthiness, a sense of brokenness when one sees the righteousness of God? What is that? And is that sin? I will try to cover these things this evening, but let me review. Genesis chapter 2, reading verses 16 and 17. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God is a fair God. God does not surprise people. God does not set an ambush for people. God is very upfront as we say and he told Adam and in telling Adam he was telling the whole world because Adam at that time was the whole world and he said to him here are all the trees that are good for food you may eat of all of them except one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God says the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. God explained to Adam what the consequences would be if he went contrary to God's clearly expressed will. And his will was, don't eat of this tree. Now, God was speaking to a, a being that had a sinless nature. Adam was made with a sinless nature and he was then supposed to develop a character. And I said this morning or this early afternoon, natures are given to us, characters we develop. Let me say that again. When Adam opened his eye and he looked into the eyes of his creator, he had a sinless nature that he did not ask for, that he did not choose. His sinless nature was not the result of the exercise of his free moral agency. Are you following me? Adam did not choose his sinless nature he woke up and he had it now he had to choose to keep it that was under his control that he had it was not his doing now he had to choose will I keep it and he could have kept it by obeying God that's choice. We know the tragic story, the catastrophic events. Adam and Eve chose contrary to God's will. And as a result, they sinned. They committed sin in the clear light of God's instructions for them. And so I said, sin is a willful conscious deliberate violation of the known revealed will of God I hope someone is praying while I'm speaking all you have to say Lord give the preacher the right words to say because the subject is sensitive 
And what we understand sin to be will affect what we understand salvation to be, what we understand justification to be, what we understand sanctic glorification to be, what we understand to be the possibility of sinless living. We have to understand what is sin. I repeat, sin is the conscious, willful, deliberate violation of the known, revealed will of God. Adam and Eve sinned. Let me add some ammunition to that position. In Genesis chapter 3, the chapter in which sin occurs, in verse 7, the Bible says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. They were not hidden by someone else. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. This is self-inflicted. The devil didn't hide them. The devil cannot make you sin. The devil cannot make me sin. I have to choose to sin. My will must purpose the act. And so the Bible is clear. Adam and his wife, they took it upon themselves to hide themselves from God. Now this wasn't a group decision. And I'll show that to you. It was individually decided. Verse 9. Genesis 3, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Verse 10, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Now you finish that verse for me and read it. I hid myself, individual. Adam individually chose to hide himself from God. He was not hidden by Eve. He was not hidden by the devil because Eve could not make him sin. The devil did not make her sin. We choose to sin. He hid himself. Let's stay in the early chapters of the book of Genesis, chapter 6, where we come in contact with the need for a flood. Reading from verse 9, well, let's read from verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The but means Noah lived a different life from the sinners described in verses 5 through 7. Now verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Verse 10. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Next verse. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. Now read verse 12. And God looked upon the earth and behold it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted what? Himself upon the earth. All flesh had corrupted himself, meaning people had corrupted themselves. I cannot corrupt you. Now you can yield to my seductions. Sin is a choice to violate what we know to be right. I also said there is such a thing as an innocent sin. A sin, I should say, a sin of ignorance. I don't want to attach the word innocence to sin. A sin of ignorance. Now that's a slightly different story. It is still a sin. Did you hear me say that? It is still a sin, but the difference is in God's reaction to the person who commits it. God has one reaction to all sin. He hates it. But he has different reactions based on people's knowledge. 
That's why Jesus says, to whom little is given, little is what? Required. To whom much is given, much is required. God is fair. In the judgment, some people will be beaten with many stripes. Some will be beaten with few stripes. A sin of ignorance. Let's look at the sin of ignorance in Genesis chapter 20, reading from verse 1. Mr. Cameraman, I am kneeling to get my bottle. I don't want to ruin your shot. All right, thank you. If I left the bottle here, would it disrupt the, uh, the, uh, the beauty of the desk? I don't want to keep kneeling and bowing for this thing. Have you found Genesis 20? Reading from verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said unto Sarah his wife, She is my sister. That's the second time he'd lied. He lied in chapter 12. And I told you earlier today, his son did the same thing and lied in chapter 26. Abraham said, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. And the Lord came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech is finding out what he did not previously know. All Abimelech knew when he took Sarah is that she and he are brothers and sisters. I can marry her. On the basis of that limited knowledge, he took a woman to be his bride. But verse 4. But Abimelech had not come near her. He hadn't touched her. He said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Now notice Abimelech describes himself and his nation as righteous. Now God said to him in verse 3, Behold, thou art but a dead man. Abimelech understood that to mean not only Abimelech, but the entire nation. That's why he says, Lord, will thou slay a righteous nation? Let me just digress. God will destroy an entire nation to defend you. If you're his child. I didn't say that very clearly because no one said, Amen, let me try again. God will destroy entire armies to defend one of his children. That's how much God loves you. So Bimlech said, Will thou slay also a righteous nation? Verse 5, Said he not unto me, She is my sister. And she, even she herself said, He is my brother. Then Abimelech something, said something very odd. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands, have I done this? Abimelech said, I did not know. I committed sin innocently. That is possible. And God did not take an opposing view. Verse 6. God said to him in a dream, Yea, I know thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. God said, I know, I saw, I witnessed that you did not know. So I agree, you did it in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me, therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now, therefore, God says, the now means you are no longer innocent because I have informed you of conditions of which you were previously unaware. This is a man's wife. Now you know that, Abimelech, what will you do? You cannot sin ignorantly in the presence of information. God said in verse 7, Genesis 20, Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he's a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. And in verse 14 is recorded the fact that Abimelech restored him Sarah, his wife. This was a man who did not know. But the fact that he did not know did not mean he hadn't sinned. It simply meant that until he knew better, God suspended judgment. God is gracious. 
And if we would understand the graciousness of God, we may have a better understanding of sin. We're told in Psalm 103, uh, verse 10, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. We have to understand the side of God. If God were to give us what we absolutely deserved, if He were to act that way, not one would survive. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. God is so merciful. He knows that we cannot take it if we were to deal with us precisely as we deserve. And so He mixes it with mercy. I love God. How many of you love God? Can I see your hand? I love God. And I am in love with God. No human being is as merciful as God is. Even though the Bible says, Blessed that are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We are supposed to be merciful, but the mercy of God is something that should cause us to wonder. Our lower drop, our jaws drop in awe. How can God be so gracious to those who don't like Him? A sin of ignorance is only a sin of ignorance. If there are two qualities to it, one, I did not know. Two, I had no way of knowing. Some people say, don't tell me. That does not qualify as a sin of ignorance. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 4 or verse 5. But this they are, they willingly are ignorant of. There are some people who delight in the bliss of ignorance. God does not count that as a sin of ignorance. You must be able to say to God squarely in the eye, I did not know and I had no way of knowing. So there is a sin that's deliberate, willful, violation of God's will. That sin incurs guilt and brings condemnation. Then there's a sin that is genuinely a sin of ignorance. That sin is still a sin, but because there's ignorance, God suspends the judgment and assigns no guilt while He works feverishly to bring us to the awareness that we have sinned. Because sins of ignorance still hurt us. Now, let's go to John 15, see what Jesus has to say. It's uh, 27 after 7. What Jesus has to say. John 15, reading verse 22, Jesus says, If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. In other words, if I had not come and revealed God's will as clearly as any person could possibly reveal, I could not have charged them with sin or with guilt. But now they have no cloak for their sins because I have spoken. Verse 24, if I had not done among them the, the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. By the words I have spoken and by the deeds I have done, Jesus says this is a double barrel demonstration that they had evidence to make the correct choices. They cannot claim to be sinless or to be ignorant. John 9, 41, Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. See, the Pharisees said, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Blindness here suggests genuine ignorance. Sin that brings condemnation and guilt is a choice we make to offend God. The choice can be a word spoken, a thought entertained, an attitude held on to, on action carried out. It involves the conscious act of the will. Sin. Now, can I be born guilty of Adam's sin? In case you fall asleep on the text I'm about to give you, the answer is no. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 16. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Old Testament and, of course, of the entire Bible. 
Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. The Bible says, do you have it? The fathers shall not what? Be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be what? Put to death for his own sin. I will not pay the penalty for Adam's sin. Ezekiel chapter 18, reading verse 20. As we continue the real truth about sin, Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, and the father shall not bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Exodus 32, reading verse 31, 32, and 33. We're trying to show that one person does not inherit somebody else's sin. We answer the question, are we guilty of Adam's sin? Exodus 32, after the Israelites have made a golden calf, Moses comes down, he sees it. He's afraid for what God will do to these rebellious people. The Bible says in verse 31, Exodus 32, and Moses returned and said unto the Lord, Oh Lord, this, the, all this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses says, look, they have sinned a great sin. Yet now if thou wilt forgive, and there's a dash, a pause, his voice seems to break. And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Verse 33, and the Lord said unto him, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Meaning, Moses, you didn't sin, I will not blot you out. I blot out those who have sinned. You cannot be guilty of Adam's sin. Romans 5.12 says, For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The reason why sin passed on us is because we have sinned like Adam, not that Adam's sin has passed on me, because I did not choose to commit Adam's sin. Romans 5.12 is clear, all have sinned. We have followed Adam's footsteps in sinning, and that which passed upon him passed to us, death. Adam cannot pass guilt to me. For me to receive guilt, I must choose to violate God's will and God's word. Sin is a conscious, willful, deliberate decision to violate the known, revealed will of God. Yes, there is such a thing called an ignorant sin, but ignorance can only be regarded by God if a person can say, I did not know and I had no way of knowing. Even if the person can say that, a sin of ignorance is still painful to God and God's desire is somehow to bring information to the offending person to say what you are doing has been wrong and the person realizing it from an honest heart falls down and repents of that ignorant sin. Because he who really loves God hates sin. And if I have time, I'll show you instance of someone repenting of sins he did not commit. That's how closeness to God changes us. We begin to say sorry for things we've not even done. Is a baby born a sinner? In John chapter 9, John 9, reading from verse 1, we have the story of the disciples and Christ. They came across a man who was blind from his birth. Now to be blind from birth, when do you have to be blind? We haven't got all night. To be blind from birth, you have to be blind when? Say it loudly. In the womb. Then you're born blind. You're not born and then go blind. You are born blind. Your blindness began in the womb. This man was born, he came out blind. The disciples said, Master, 
Who saying this man or his parents that he was born blind? In other words, is his blindness the result of his parents' sin or his sin? Now, if a man is born blind and he's blind because of his sin, when did he sin? I will not be offended if you answer me. We are friends. One of the prayer requests someone wrote, we love you. <laughs> so you love me, answer me. If a man, he had to have sinned in the womb. But what did Jesus say? Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents. Now Jesus wasn't saying that that grown up blind man had never sinned in his life. What Jesus is saying, it was not because he sinned in the womb. Am I saying babies don't need Christ? Yes, they do need Christ. Enoch walked with God and God took him. He still needed Christ. If a man or a woman comes to the place where that person no longer sins, the person still needs Christ because Christ gives power to forgive sins and he gives power to remain above sin. We always need Christ. A baby cannot sin in the womb. A baby does not know right from wrong. But is the baby born with a sinful nature? Yes. Oh, yes. As innocent and smooth-skinned as that little creature is, that creature has a nature to sin. And the evidence of selfishness is evidenced very early in life. But a baby is not born guilty of any sin. God is too good and too gracious. We've answered the question, what is sin? We've answered the question, what is innocent or ignorant sin? We've answered the question, can I be guilty of Adam's sin? We've answered the question, can a baby be born a sinner in the sense of having sinned somewhere in the womb? The answer is no. Now I want to take a look at a fe feeling broken. Realizing the righteousness of God and what it does to a person. Remember Isaiah, woe is me, for I'm a man of undone lips. Woe is me. Remember Job, Job 42 verse 6. I see God and I hate myself and repent in sackcloth and ashes. When that occurs to a person, that sense of my nothingness, my distance from God's ideal, what is that? And is that of itself a sin? Can I confess something I didn't do? Let's go to Daniel. Chapter 6. This is a story where Daniel is cast into a lion's den because he refused to pray to Darius. He prayed to his God. A trap was set for him. Daniel continued to serve his God knowing the trap was set. And he was cast into a lion's den. Daniel 6. The king could not sleep. We pick it up at verse 20. 22 minutes to 8. The king came to the den. The Bible says in verse 20 of Daniel 6. And when he came to the mouth of the den, he cried with a lamentable cry of voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually? What does continually mean? All the time. This is a heathen king and he has realized that Daniel serves his God continually. Is thy God? Whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. And Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. And by the way, when people say you'll burn in hell forever, that's not true. Because Daniel said live forever, but that's not really what he meant. He just meant live until you die. Live long, but not forever and ever. But that's another story. Verse 22. And Daniel said, My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. Before him, who is him? God. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Now what is Daniel saying? Daniel is saying, God shut the lion's mouth because I was innocent before God and I was innocent before you. I was innocent in the presence of heaven and earth. Daniel knew 
that he had not sinned. Did that make Daniel proud? Did that mean Daniel did not need more grace? Not at all. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Now Daniel is praying because he wants to understand the prophecies of, of, of Jeremiah. The 70 years of captivity are about to, to end. Daniel wants to understand visions he has received. He is praying. And in verse 5, Daniel says, We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and thy judgments. The Bible records no sin Daniel committed. I'm not saying he never sinned in his life, but Daniel had come to the place where his life was so close with God. There are few men or women of whom the Bible says nothing about sin in their lives. Daniel is one. Darius was a witness. Thy God whom thou servest continually. Yet this man can pray, we have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. We have rebelled. Daniel said we. He included himself. He felt broken. He identified with his sinning people. That's a spirit of being broken. Yet not having committed a sin. When a man or a woman comes close to God, that person sees his or her true condition. How undone I am. How much more I need to come close to my Savior. And the person goes to his or her knees and says, Lord God, how I hate this sinful nature. I am so sorry that I have it because this nature is a standing offense in your eyes. Yes, the sinful nature is an offense to God. But it's not an offense you cause or I cause. But we're still broken that we have it. And we're sorry and we'll repent of something we haven't done. If recognizing your undone condition is itself a sin, then there is no way a person can be forgiven because the closer we come to God, the more we realize how undone we are. And so we are constantly in a state of sin. But the Bible is so clear. John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away. When God forgives, He removes. Revelation 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace be unto you and peace from Him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before His throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and have washed us from our sins in his own blood sin is removed when God forgives us but the sinful nature remains that's why Paul says in Galatians 5 16 this I say then Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things ye would. It is a constant battle because conversion does not remove the sinful nature. It remains, but the nature itself is not a sin of which you and I are guilty. But is it an offense? Yes. The sinful nature is an offense in the eyes of God because that was not his original plan when he made Adam. He made Adam sinless. And when Jesus returns, this mortal shall put on immortality and this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Only then will this sinful nature, this tendency to sin, be eradicated because God cannot improve the sinful nature. There is only one response he has for it and that is to destroy it. And so as you and I sit and stand in this place, we're saved if we've accepted Christ. But are we tempted? Yes. Why? We still have that nature. Will we be tempted in heaven? No. Sinful nature gone. Temptations arise from the sinful nature. Those unclean lusts, they arise from the sinful nature. James 1, 13 through 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of the Lord. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. There is a chronology to sin. 
Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. There are steps before you sin. The desire to steal is not a sin. Now if you start thinking about it, you have sinned it here. Your will must act. When those two thieves were on the cross with Jesus Christ, as a quarter to eight, Luke 23, verse 39 to 43, the Bible says, And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Now, the thief on the right is talking to the thief on the left. Christ is in the middle listening to this exchange. And I can almost see these two crucified men trying to lean off the cross to see each other as they talk across Jesus Christ. Then in verse 42, the Bible says, He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Those words merely expressed the conversion that had already taken in that man's heart when he recognized Jesus as Savior and he recognized he deserved what he was getting. And at that point, he was a changed man. His sins were removed. And Jesus said, Early I say unto thee today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. We don't know how long that thief lived. But if Jesus says you'll be with him in paradise, no one can change that. Jesus died before the two thieves died. That man was on the cross for a while. Been a thief all his life. But Jesus removed his sins. His sinful nature remained and will only be removed at the resurrection. But on that cross, he died saved and right with God. Am I attempting to tr treat sin lightly? Not in the least. Let me tell you, sin is the worst thing that has ever happened in this world, large or small. We must ask God to put hatred in our hearts for sin. Indeed, a man or a woman cannot claim to be a child of God if he or she does not have perfect hatred for sin. The very first promise of Scripture, Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Hatred God has promised. Ask Him to help us to hate sin. We can't tolerate sin in others. You know, some people say, I don't do it, but it's fine if you want to do it. Uh-uh. If you have that attitude, the Bible regards you as guilty as the person actually doing that thing. We must hate sin wherever we find it, in us or in others. But like God, we must love people but hate sin. You see, God reacts towards sin without mercy. He reacts towards sinners with mercy. Am I clear? Mm hmm the only reason why some people go to hell is because when God comes to destroy sin, He finds sin in them. Jesus is standing by now to remove your sins. The Bible says in Psalm 103, from verse 10, He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as far, for as high as the heaven is above the earth, so far, so high as His mercy, or so great is His mercy to them that fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. He removes them and gives us power to resist the cry of the nature that we still have, but it's control, that is what is crucified. It's control in our lives, it's reign in our lives is crucified. Knowing this, that all man of sin is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, Romans 6 verse 6. The control of sin, that is what is broken. But the presence, 
remains the presence of the sinful nature but let me say this it is possible to live a sinless life even though we have the sinful nature because the sinful nature itself is not a sin but like Daniel the closer we come to Christ the more we will start telling God I am so sorry even though we have not actually done it. So if I am close to Christ and I study the state of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and I see how hypocritical we are and how far we have drifted from God's plan, I fall on my knees and I say, Lord, forgive us, not them. We have drifted. We are hypocritical. We are inconsistent. Forgive us. A view of God's holiness breaks me down. And I mourn that I am not like God. But that act of being broken down is not itself a sin. My brothers and my sisters, 10 to 8, I've kept you long enough. Thank you for your patience and attention. You and I must put distance between ourselves and sin, regardless of the size of the sin or its presumed innocence. The Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. The smallest sin, if it remains unconfessed, will take you to hell. Because when the Bible says Jesus Christ died for sin, it did not specify a size. Any sin required the death of Jesus Christ. Which means, all sin deserves death. That's how horrible sin is. If I drive 45 in a 35, I get a ticket. I don't get life in prison. Not in Michigan, at least. I am not sentenced to the electric chair if I steal a CD from somebody. From Paul Melinda's store. I get probation, a fine. God's holiness is so great. Any sin I commit deserves death. Don't let anyone disturb you. Any sin I commit deserves death. That's not an expression of how cruel God is, but a representation of how holy He is. Now let me tell you something. Take a grain of sand. And I'm finishing. Try to swallow it. And as we say, let it go down the wrong way. You will roll on the ground coughing, calling 911. Why? Because a grain of sand, instead of going down the right way, it went down your windpipe where it doesn't belong. And the reaction on you will be such that someone may assume that you have come to the end of your life a small sin affects God like that a million times multiplied. All sin deserve death. We must hate sin. It lies at the foundation of all our problems. And the call I made earlier today, I will make this evening. Let me tell you, I'm a preacher who does not mind if no one responds to what I say, as long as the non-response is genuine. Never respond to my appeals because that makes me feel good. That's not why I'm here. Respond only if it is genuine, sincere, and you feel the needling conviction of the Holy Spirit. Outside of that, stay where you are. Never respond because you're trying to please me. I did not come to be pleased. Let me make my call to you as your brother in Christ. You have heard about sin. No one can preach a perfect sermon. Someone else will come and preach about sin six months down the road and you will understand it much more clearly. No human being can preach perfect truth. Only Jesus Christ. But we try. 
And you go to God and you say, Father, explain this to me. And you open the Bible for yourselves. Jesus Christ died <clears throat> for you. Not the person next to you. Forget that. He died for you. I want you to personalize it. I want you to see him on the cross bleeding, groaning. His mother doubled over in pain as she looks into the eyes of her firstborn son. And there's nothing she could do, not even to wipe the blood from his face. And there's nothing he could do to ease her grief. She can't even lean on his shoulders. He is stuck to that cross. And the firstborn looks in the eyes of his mother, the mother into his eyes. And there is pain beyond the physical. Why? For you. And just before he closed his eyes, he looked at his apostle John. He said, John, behold thy mother. He tells his dear mother, mother, behold thy son. Take care of my mother in his last few seconds of life. For you and for me. Is my gratitude to him to sin? It cannot be. And so I ask you tonight. If... There is something we are doing we know to be sin. I call upon you in the name of Jesus Christ to stop by His grace. Let me repeat that. If there is something we know we are doing and it is sin, I call upon you in the sacred name of Jesus Christ to stop by His grace. Turn from it and seek His power never to do it again. Any person who will honestly say, Father, I am struggling with something it has tripped me up over and over again. I need an extra portion of divine power. I have this struggle and I want to overcome. If there's someone who fits that description, I want you to stand up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask in the name of Jesus to look with favor upon us. Upon those who have stood, those who remain seating, who should have perhaps stood, those with struggles in their hearts, Lord, a terrific conflict. Those who have a desire to obey you, but they're so weak. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name, look upon us with mercy, favor, tender compassion, don't give us what we deserve, but deliver us from sin, we pray. Father, there's some things we do over and over and over, and we know they are wrong. And we do them, and we do them. And tonight, Lord, we stand to say, in the name of Jesus, Father, deliver us from this bondage of sin, this slavery to iniquity. Give us the very power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave, the power to reverse death. Give us that power to reverse this sinful behavior that we have practiced so many years. Lord, a prayer for power over sin is according to your will. We ask you to answer us generously tonight. And fill our hearts with hatred, God. Fill our hearts with hatred for sin. Hatred for the devil. And give us a growing love for spiritual things, for your word, for your prayer, for wherever your people gather to worship. Give us a love for that which is of heaven. Oh, Father, have mercy on us, we pray. And when you come into your kingdom, save us for the sake of Christ. And because you love us, we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. He had it was not his doing. Now he had to choose, will I keep it? And he could have kept it by obeying God. 
That's choice. We know the tragic story, the catastrophic events. Adam and Eve chose contrary to God's will. And as a result, they sinned. They committed sin in the clear light of God's instructions for them. And so I said, sin is a willful, conscious, deliberate violation of the known, revealed will of God. I hope someone is praying while I'm speaking. All you have to say, Lord, give the preacher the right words to say because the subject is sensitive. And what we understand sin to be will affect what we understand salvation to be, what we understand justification to be, what we understand sanctic glorification to be, what we understand to be the possibility of sinless living. We have to understand what is sin. I repeat, sin is the conscious, willful, deliberate violation of the known, revealed will of God. Adam and Eve sinned. Let me add some ammunition to that position. In Genesis chapter 3, the chapter in which sin occurs, in verse 7, the Bible says, And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. They were not hidden by someone else. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. This is self-inflicted. The devil didn't hide them. The devil cannot make you sin. The devil cannot make me sin. I have to choose to sin. My will must purpose the act. And so the Bible is clear. Adam and his wife, they took it upon themselves to hide themselves from God. Now, this wasn't a group decision. And I'll show that to you. It was individually decided. Verse 9, Genesis 3, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Verse 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Now you finish that verse for me and read it. I hid myself. Individual. Adam individually chose to hide himself from God. He was not hidden by Eve. He was not hidden by the devil because Eve could not make him sin. The devil did not make her sin. We choose to sin. He hid himself. Let's stay in the early chapters of the book of Genesis, chapter 6, where we come in contact with the need for a flood. Reading from verse 9, well, let's read from verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Verse 8 says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The but means Noah lived a different life from the sinners described in verses 5 through 7. Now verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Verse 10, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Next verse, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now read verse 12, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted what? Himself upon the earth. All flesh had corrupted himself, meaning people had corrupted themselves. I cannot corrupt you. Now you can yield to my seductions. It 
Sin is a choice to violate what we know to be right. I also said there is such a thing as an innocent sin. A sin, I should say, as sin of ignorance. I don't want to attach the word innocence to sin. A sin of ignorance. That time was the whole world. And he said to him, Here are all the trees that are good for food. You may eat of all of them except one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. God explained to Adam what the consequences would be if he went contrary to God's clearly expressed will. And his will was, don't eat of this tree. Now, God was speaking to a, a being that had a sinless nature. Adam was made with a sinless nature and he was then supposed to develop a character. And I said this morning or this early afternoon, natures are given to us, characters we develop. Let me say that again. When Adam opened his eye and he looked into the eyes of his creator, he had a sinless nature that he did not ask for, that he did not choose. His sinless nature was not the result of the exercise of his free moral agency. Are you following me? Adam did not choose his sinless nature he woke up and he had it now he had to choose to keep it that was under his control that he the real truth about sin is our subject for this evening as it was this afternoon when i called it what is sin I'll tell you briefly what we talked about at our 12 o'clock service. I stressed that sin is fundamentally a conscious choice to go contrary to God's will. Tonight, I will introduce some concepts that I did not mention earlier today. One, I will deal with the question, can I be guilty of Adam's sin? Two, is my sinful nature itself a sin? Three, is a baby born guilty of sin? Four, what is this thing called a sense of unworthiness, a sense of brokenness when one sees the righteousness of God? What is that? And is that sin? I will try to cover these things this evening, but let me review. Genesis chapter 2, reading verses 16 and 17. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. God is a fair God. God does not surprise people. God does not set an ambush for people. God is very upfront as we say. And he told Adam and in telling Adam, he was telling the whole world. Because Adam, 